When a certain toy line clicks with the consumer and brings in more money for the toy company, just like almost any successful venture, what comes next is pretty predictable. More money means more toys. And not just more toys, more colorful toys, more unique toys, and more often than not, more cooler toys. So with all these brand new toys coming in year after year, exactly what happens to all the other toys that came before? Well, their fate is almost just as predictable. Back in 1982, the once popular but at the time dormant G.I. Joe toys from the 60s to the 70s were relaunched for a new generation of kids with one key difference. Whereas the original Joes were composed of 12-inch scale do I mean action figures, inspired by the immense success of the smaller 3.75-inch scaled Star Wars toys, these new Joes followed suit. Aside from the smaller size though, these new real American heroes also differed from their predecessors in terms of their marketing strategy, which focused on featuring a team of actual individual characters complete with unique personalities and specialties neatly laid out in a file card that each toy came packaged with. And taking another page from the Star Wars playbook, while these new Joes weren't tied to a mega movie franchise, the toys were cross-promoted through other different media as well, specifically a comic book produced by Marvel and a cartoon series, both of which were pretty popular in their own right. And so with this winning formula, these new G.I. Joes were a success right out of the gate. The first wave of toys, composed of a modest 11 single-carded figures and 7 vehicles, flew off the toy shelves. So much so that it was inevitable that more toys would follow in the next year. And the year after that, and the year after that, and the year… well, you get the picture. When it was all said and done, by 1994, Hasbro had managed to create a toy line that boasted a lineup of over 500 figures and 250 vehicles and playsets, including an aircraft carrier called the USS Flag, which at a length of 7.5 feet is the largest modern toy ever produced. But I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Let's go back to where it all started. Wave 1. All in all, there were 15 unique characters released in retail, with two of them designated as Cobra, the enemy. This left the remaining 13 as the good guys, the first real American hero team, nostalgically referred to by many collectors, including myself, as the original 13. Anyway, like any lineup of characters, whether it's by design or pure luck, it's inevitable that a few certain individuals in the group end up standing out, while others fade into the background, into oblivion. And so as the line continued, with more and more toys introduced every year, it's only natural that a majority of the original 13 were outright replaced by newer, shinier characters. While on occasion, some would make an unexpected comeback in the latter part of the line, sporting some new equipment and more colorful duds, like I said, for the most part, they were basically forgotten. But not by me, and I'm assuming other collectors who were fortunate enough to get into this toy line from the very start and have very nostalgic and fond memories of these original green men. And so now, with that long intro out of the way, I'd like to get into the meat of this story. If you didn't catch my previous episode wherein I just gave a quick introduction as to who the original 13 were, feel free to check it out here. Having done that, what I'd like to move on to is to give a rundown on what exactly happened to the original 13 as the line progressed through the years. Who remained relevant until the end? Who made unexpected comebacks further down the line? And who were unfortunately forgotten? And who replaced them? Before I start though, I'd like to keep things properly framed. First, I will only be covering what many consider to be the original retail run of the Real American Hero line, which spanned from 1982 to 1994. Second, in terms of newer versions, while I will mention recolors if there are any, I'd like to mainly focus on actual redesigns of the character. And finally, just a disclaimer, I got out of collecting Joes as a kid around 1989, so I'm not very familiar with most of the stuff after that. So as much as I'd like to think that I've got everything covered, I'm pretty sure I haven't. So if I missed anything or got certain details wrong, let me know. And I think that should cover it. So let's start things off by getting the easiest ones out of the way. The ones who remained relevant. And on top of that list is the Commando Snake Eyes. The most popular Joe ever. He's so popular that ever since his first figure, Hasbro has made over 60 60 different versions and variations of this guy. 
But again, for the sake of not making myself go crazy, like I said, I'll only be covering his releases between 1982 and 1994, of which there are four unique ones. After his original Commando look from the first wave, Snake Eyes version 2 came out in 1985, and this is arguably his most popular and iconic look. It's where Hasbro stepped up on his whole ninja background by giving him a sword and replacing his goggles with what I can only describe as a knight's visor. Well, whatever it was, it looked cool. To be honest though, what really got me most excited about this version was that it came with his trusty sidekick, the wolf, Timber. If this is the only version of Snake Eyes you ever had, then you were good as gold because everything that followed after that, in my opinion, was just diminishing returns. The next Snake Eyes came out in 1989 and was a little bit more of an updated version of his original Commando look, just with more ninja weapons. Most eye-catching of the bunch being those two ginormous knives hanging in an X pattern over his chest. 1991 brought us what I consider to be the oddest version of Snake Eyes yet. I guess brownie points for trying to do something different with the guy, but the bright blue elements and his huge red goggles just don't scream Snake Eyes to me. And the final version that followed in 1993 kind of dialed things back a bit. At this point, Hasbro was all in on the whole ninja fad of the 90s, so this guy is better known as Ninja Force Snake Eyes. The most unique feature of this version is that he sported neither goggles nor a visor, just a plain black head with two white eyes. Perhaps to accentuate the whole snake eyes of the character? Oh well, for me though, I just found it lazy, and of all the versions of Snake Eyes, this is the one with the least personality for me, looking more like a generic superhero than a commando or a ninja. Next up is what most fans consider to be Snake's better half, Scarlet. Although, if you ask me, I'm more of a Duke Scarlet shipper. Anyway, considering how popular Scarlet is in the whole franchise, it's quite surprising to see her only get one new version in the entire line run. But if you were more familiar with the climate then, it would make more sense. Back then, many companies believed that girl action figures wouldn't sell very well with boys. So female action figures were few and far between. And as for G.I. Joe, we got at most two, if we were lucky, two new token females every year. And so rather than rehash an older character, no matter how popular, I guess Hasbro opted to dazzle us boys with newer femme fatales every year. So with that being said, the only updated version of Scarlet finally came in 1993 as part of the aforementioned Ninja Force line. And you'd think that after all the advancements in female design Hasbro had done since the original Scarlet figure, they would have given us a more practical, tactical, uniformed Scarlet. But this was more of a case of two steps back for them. I guess they believed that female ninjas also wore leotards. I don't know. This was basically a more superhero fied version of the original Scarlet, in even more gaudier colors. Oh well, at least this one came with a ponytail. One thing worth mentioning though is that the original Scarlet toy was released internationally in Argentina by the toy company Plastirama, in different colors and as a different character called Glenda. And even if she wasn't originally part of the mainline canon, Glenda is actually going to be released as one of the pack-in figures for this year's classified HasLab project, the Dragonfly Helicopter. Next, we have Stalker. As one of the first Joes to stand out in Wave 1 with his camouflage deco as well as being heavily featured in the first G.I. Joe miniseries, I thought it was only a matter of time before Stalker would get an updated figure in the toy line. Even if a new Ranger was introduced in 1986 called Beachhead, Stalker's comeback was more or less expected, and true enough, in 1989, he was back, with a twist. He was no longer Stalker the Ranger, but Stalker the Tundra Ranger, still sporting his signature camo pattern, just with some added winter gear, and trading in his beret for a more snug beanie, ready to do battle in the snow. I guess this was done to differentiate him more from Beachhead, who himself had become very popular with the fans. This Stalker came fully equipped with a machine gun mounted kayak, Talk about a major upgrade. The next two Stalkers came out in 1992 and 1994 as parts of the Talking Battle Commanders and Battle Corps respectively. To be honest, these guys came out way after I was done collecting Joes as a kid. They're decent, I guess, but neither of them come close to his original iconic look in my opinion. Oh, and since I mentioned International Joes earlier, Plasterama also gave Stalker the Glenda treatment, releasing the toy in a different color scheme based on the Argentinian flag and as another unique character, the paratrooper Manle, 
They also painted in some added facial hair and curiously made him Caucasian. And finally, we have Hawk. Considering that he was the original leader of the G.I. Joe team, it was quite odd to see him not released single-carded and instead packaged with a vehicle. But Hawk's version 2, released in 1986, left no doubt in anybody's mind. He was no longer just the missile commander. Hawk was the G.I. Joe commander and looked every bit the part. I would argue that this is the iconic look for Hawk, no longer looking like a Duke wannabe, but his own character with his own unique head sculpt that would be used for future versions of Hawk moving forward. While this Hawk looked every bit of what a senior commanding leader of G.I. Joe should look like, for his next version, Hasbro took a complete about face, sticking him inside a futuristic looking flight suit complete with a bubble helmet and wings decked with missiles. I guess they wanted to tap into his Hawk name literally for this one. The final two Hawks went for opposite ends of the spectrum. In 1992, he returned to a more practical and traditional militaristic look with his inclusion in the Talking Battle Commander subline. But a year later, Hasbro went full sci-fi with their Star Brigade Armor Tech subline and leading the charge was Armor Tech Commander Hawk, who seemingly coming full circle came packaged once again with a vehicle, the G.I. Joe Armor Bot. He definitely came a long way from commanding his mobile missile system. And that finishes up the original 13 members who stayed relevant through the years. The next group is composed of members who made at least one more comeback before the line ended in 1994. When the heavy machine gunner roadblock was introduced in 1984, I'm pretty sure many collectors including myself figured it was game over for the original machine gunner rock and roll. I mean it seemed like Roadblock had him beat in every category. Visually, he looked far more interesting and imposing. He had a cool and personable personality in the cartoon, and most importantly, he wielded a bigger gun. But just when all seemed lost, the OG-13 former surfer and bassist turned machine gunner made a surprising return with a second version in 1989, and this time around, he came double wielding twin Gatling guns. Rock and roll. Two years later, the same version was released in a more Christmas-inspired color scheme and with less impressive weaponry as part of the Supersonic Fighter subset. And for good measure, a final version of Rock and Roll was included as part of the Star Brigade Armor Tech subset. But the less said about that version, the better. I think it's also worth mentioning that another machine gunner was introduced in 1988, the Steady Cam Machine Gunner Repeater. And while he looks pretty cool, he places a distant third behind both Roadblock and Rock and Roll in my book. Grunt. Of all the original Joes, to me, Grunt was the plainest looking of the bunch. Even when he was recolored tan and repacked with the G.I. Joe Falcon attack glider in the second year of the line, he still looked pretty basic to me. So I wasn't particularly gutted when he was seemingly phased out in both the comics, being honorably discharged, and in the cartoons after he opted to remain in an alternate dimension with other fellow OG members, Steeler and Clutch. And when a new infantryman, Footloose, was introduced in 1985, I figured that would be the last I'd see of Grunt. But just like rock and roll, Grunt made his triumphant return into the line in 1991 with a much snazzier look and was now promoted to infantry squad leader. To be honest, despite the added detail and color, he still manages to look bland, and the little Superman curl on his forehead doesn't do him any favors. Oh well, at least they tried to make him relevant again. But as far as infantrymen go, I'll throw in my lot with the light infantryman Hit and Run, introduced in 1988. Now that is how you redesign a more visually interesting infantry. Zap. For the longest time, I thought that Zap was one of the forgotten and faced out members of the OJ-13. So I was quite surprised to find out when putting together this episode that he actually did make a comeback together with his fellow OG member Grunt in 1991. In retrospect, how cool would it have been if Hasbro dedicated an entire wave, one year, to updated versions of the original team? How awesome would that have been? Anyway, Zap was slotted into the subset of Supersonic Fighters. And boy did this new version come with a whole load of weaponry. When all decked out, he actually looked more like a cyborg than an actual soldier. Oh well, at least this time, they gave him a mustache. And as an aside, while Zap was off in limbo, I'd like to think his specialty as a bazooka soldier was taken over by missile specialist Bazooka, who carried a more portable rocket launcher and sported an even larger mustache. 
And finally, the last member of this comeback group is the vamp driver himself, Clutch. Yet another one I didn't know got an update until I started this episode. Anyway, since his debut as part of the original 13, there have been a good number of Jeep-type vehicles that succeeded the vamp through the years, each with their own respective driver. Most notable of these would be the Awe Striker, released in 1985, which came with the Joe Crank case. Two years later, we got the Crossfire with driver Rumbler, and finally the Desert Fox in 1988 with the unfortunately named Skidmark. But as cool as these vehicles were in their own right, maybe I'm being biased here, but none of them come close to the original vamp. And none of the respected drivers can hold a candle to clutch. I mean, the guy oozes with personality and literally motor oil, which he uses on his hair. So I was quite happy to find out that Clutch 2 made a comeback in 1993. This time though, as a single carded figure and part of the Mega Marines subset. Now, if you showed me this figure out of context, there would be no way I would think that this dude was Clutch. Clean shaven with a bright neon orange suit, Clutch would be the last Joe I would think of. But when you flip over his file card, there is no mistaking Clutch as he says that he still greases his hair with motor oil. Now I never had this figure or any of the other Mega Marines, but as far as gimmicks go, I have to say that this has got to be one of the strangest. Essentially, they sported moldable bio armor that was basically Play-Doh that you could mold into armor parts for the Joes. Okay, moving on. And now we have the final group of original 13 members. The ones who were flat out replaced, starting with the communications officer, Breaker. Of all the guys in this group, Breaker was the one I was most surprised to not get any new updated version, as he was fairly prominent in the earlier episodes of the cartoon. But apparently, after his original figure, that was it for Breaker. He was basically replaced in the line by the new communications expert, Dialtone, in 1986, who sported a more colorful getup and even cooler communication equipment. He was also fully armed with a submachine pistol, which was one of my knocks against Breaker, whose only figure came weaponless. Still, despite the seemingly superior equipment, I'll take Breaker over Dial Tone any day. And as a testament to the popularity of the character, when the first live-action G.I. Joe movie, The Rise of Cobra, came out in 2009, Breaker made the team. Okay, okay, so this wasn't the OG Breaker, Alvin Kibbe, but a new character named Abel Shaz. Still, he was their communications tech guy with the codename Breaker. And as a nice callback, in one of the scenes, this new Breaker chews bubblegum and blows a bubble just like the original. Next up, Flash. Okay, so this one kinda hurts, as Flash was my first favorite Joe, handpicked from the original 13. And apparently, based on the comments from my last video, he seemed like the favorite for many early collectors as well. So why no update? Who knows? But I guess the fact that Flash as a laser trooper kinda became redundant in a cartoon wherein practically everyone shot lasers played a big part in his disappearance. Although I think the real reason why Flash never made a comeback was for two main reasons. First, I'm guessing that Hasbro probably didn't want to get into any copyright trouble with DC for the name Flash. And two, his replacement Sci-Fi, who debuted in 1986, was infinitely cooler in my opinion. As the only Joe who had the right to dress up in neon, it was another case of love at first sight for me with Sci-Fi, and all the love that I had for Flash instantly transferred onto this new laser trooper. What is it with me and lasers? Anyway, since I brought up the live-action movie The Rise of Cobra, I think it's only fair to mention that Flash did get a modern update in the toy line that followed, even if he wasn't actually in the movie. But that was way after the original Real American Hero line ended, so it doesn't really count. Steeler As the driver of the highlight of the first wave of G.I. Joe toys, the motorized tank Mobat, you'd think that Steeler would have been a bigger deal, right? Well, I guess that because the Mobat was just a perfect traditional tank toy, Hasbro was hard-pressed to replace it. They did try, though, in 1985 with the Mauler MBT tank, driven by the Joe Heavy Metal. But in my opinion, the Mobat still comes out on top, and for my money, Steeler still bests Heavy Metal easily. So with a perfect tank already in line, I guess Hasbro went the other way with more futuristic tank hybrids moving forward like the Havoc or Persuader, and so on. But I really don't count those as Mobat replacements. Unlike Clutch, I don't think Steeler had enough of a unique personality to go out on his own as a single-carded figure. But what do I know? In the end, Steeler was basically one and done. 
Next, as possibly the least memorable member of the original 13 in my opinion, it's no surprise to me that Grand Slam never got another updated version, aside from his silver padding recolor in the second year of the line. And while he was initially packaged with the Heavy Artillery Laser, or HAL, he is mostly associated as a jetpack trooper, since he was later included with the Jet Mobile Propulsion Unit. So on that front, as a jetpack trooper, Grand Slam was ultimately replaced by the mail-in exclusive Joe, Starduster, in 1987. Yes, I know I said I would only cover retail releases, but Starduster is the only solely designated jetpack trooper I could find. If there are any others that I missed, please do let me know. And finally, we have Short Fuse, my figure zero, the first Joe I ever got for myself, and unfortunately, the only Short Fuse we got in the original run of the line. It would be a full seven years later until we got his official replacement, the Mortar Man, Downtown, released in 1989. I was no longer collecting Joes by this time, but if I was, I'm pretty sure that this guy would have been one of my favorites, given his connection to my very first Joe. But bringing things full circle, the first official updated Short Fuse released would be in 2004 as part of a Toys R Us exclusive Night Force set. And while it was a different toy from the original, it was actually just a repainted re-release of Downtown. Of course, this doesn't count given that it came out after the original toy run, but I thought it was an interesting tidbit to share. And that pretty much covers it. Even if many of the original 13 were ultimately retired through the years, as a group, they will always have that special distinction as the first real American heroes we ever met. And that can't be taken away from them. And for me, they will never be replaced or forgotten. So what about you guys? What are some of your favorite updated versions or outright replacements to the original 13? Do you think that these updated versions or outright replacements are better? Or which of the original 13 are you dying to see make a triumphant return next in the classified line? Let me know in the comments below and tell me your story. Thanks for watching Stories from the Toy Shelf. If you enjoyed this story, why not check another one? And please help me out by giving me a like or comment and subscribe to the channel to get notifications whenever I upload a new story. Until the next one.